As mentioned in episode 66, Filmic has had a major overhaul in Darktable 3.2.1, and in this video, we're going to dive on in and have a look at what's new. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 67 of Understanding Darktable. This is my second attempt at this video because I recently upgraded to the NVIDIA drivers under Linux and it caused all this flickering and it turns out there's a setting you need to deactivate to stop that happening. So, second run at it. I am running out of time because we're going on holiday this weekend, so this is probably going to be a much more concise run through than the first take, so that's probably a good thing. Okay, so Filmic has been revised, it is now version 4, Aurelian has been working hard on the code to improve it. Just a quick recap for those who have forgotten or are just coming to the party new, Filmic is designed to replace what has been the default workflow up until now, which was the base curve module. Now, the base curve module was designed to try and emulate the in-camera JPEG processing for a whole range of cameras. And it it's not awful, but it has its limitations, and one of Aurelian's main issues with it is the fact that it works in the lab color space, which is a non-linear color space, and for reasons that I'm still not convinced I fully understand, Aurelian believes we really should be working in a linear RGB color space for our image processing. One of the downsides of being in the lab color space using things like the base curve is a lack of color consistency when it comes to things like local filters, things like blur and sharpen. Apparently, under a linear workflow, those things become a lot more stable. I'll take his word for it. One of the new things in version 4 of the Filmic module is the fact that there is now a mask which allows us to create a transition between blown pixels and non-blown pixels, or clipped versus non-clipped pixels. Uh, we'll dive into that in just a sec, but what makes that so good is it helps to soften the transition between those pixels which are clipped and those pixels which are not clipped. Now, as I mentioned in episode 66, if we look at the preferences, there is a new tab here called processing and this fourth option auto apply pixel workflow workflow <laughs> defaults this has three options scene referred display referred and none now the default setting when you first open darktable 3.2.1 is display referred. And what that means is that when you import a new raw file into Darktable that Darktable hasn't seen before, and Darktable creates the XMP sidecar file, it will use a display referred workflow, which means it will use base curve by default. Now, if you want to go down the route that Aurelian is suggesting, you would choose scene referred. And what that means is that when you import a new raw file, two things are going to happen by default. One, the filmic module will be enabled. And two, the exposure module will be enabled. And, wait for it, there will be a half stop or 0.5 EV boost to the exposure of every image. Now, before you go, what the what? The reason for this is because what Aurelian is trying to do is to mimic the in-camera JPEG look that most cameras generate, right? If you were to look at the raw data, your histogram you know, might be perfectly central in terms of the distribution of data, but you look at the in-camera JPEG and everything's going to be shifted just a little bit to the right because it's a little bit brighter because the in-camera processor, you know, creates a bit of brightness and a bit of contrast and it just sort of jazzes it all up so the JPEGs really pop. 
And that's what Aurelian is trying to go for with Filmic. So instead of using base curve, we're using exposure and Filmic, both linear, uh, to create something closer to that in-camera JPEG look. The third option there is none. So if you don't want anything to happen by default, so you know we used to have the option of unchecking the box which said auto apply base curve on import. If you still want that option, you would simply choose none. Then there will be no base curve, no filmic, no exposure boost, nothing, and you can handle your workflow however you want to do it. But we're here to talk about filmic. So we're going to go scene referred. Now, I do quickly want to address the Fuji shooters. Aurelian has mentioned in his release notes for filmic v4 that the half stop exposure boost that is the default in the exposure module when you enable a scene referred workflow that may not be enough for fuji cameras because apparently fuji cameras and their light meters tend to be quite conservative and he suggests that if you're shooting fuji you might need as much as one and a quarter stops uh, of ev boost in the exposure module to then go along with the filmic module but there is a tip that i can give you and i'll leave that until the end of the video because we do want to move on uh, something else that aurelian has mentioned is that this whole half stop ev boost and the filmic module should work for 80 percent of the images you throw at it assuming of course that you've allowed the camera to meter your images for you obviously if you've manually exposed then there might need to be a little bit more wiggle room. But 80% of the time, this should work. For the other 20%, you will just have to go in and manually tweak. Okay, with that being said, I have pulled three images out of my library that we're going to use for this episode. And let's have a very quick look at them. I am going to have to reset this because I've been mucking around with it. This is an outtake from a family holiday ugh, 10 years ago. Uh, and as you can see, some quite blown highlights in this one. This is just an image from uh, a cruise holiday that we did a couple of years ago. And this one here is an HDR image in DNG format compiled in Darktable from seven different exposures. Uh, and I... Ooh, I'd have to go back and check the original source images to recall exactly what exposure range that covered. I think I was shooting at half stop intervals. So we're probably looking at a good three or four stops of uh, difference between the brightest and the darkest frame that made up this composite. But as you can see, uh, this was shot on a beach in uh, Portimao on the south coast of Portugal in 2017. And... There's some pretty extremes, you know, in terms of tonal uh, range here. And I shot this deliberately to be an HDR test case. So those are the three images we're going to look at. So let's go back to the first image. And because all of these images have already been in my library for quite some time, they have not automatically inherited filmic and exposure because they haven't been imported new they're already here so i'm going to have to do that manually now i look at this image and it's already clipped and i'm thinking do i really want to be adding a half stop of exposure i kind of think i don't but i'll trust aurelian at his words so right click oh get keem on running okay exposure half stop 0 0.5 there we go it's now even more clipped than it was before and now we can jump over to the filmic rgb and activate that now in terms of all of the options that we've got here i will go back over the things that haven't changed in filmic as well as run through the things that are new we start off with the scene tab 
and we have a white relative exposure slider and a black relative expo exposure slider and the dynamic range scaling. We also have auto tune levels and the auto tune levels is a toggle on and off. So we can simply click on that eyedropper and as you can see, it puts this bounding box over the majority of our image. So it's basically taking a reading of a probably 98% of our frame. And it's taking a guess at what the white exposure and black exposure should be. Now, personally, I feel like it crushes the blacks a bit too much. So if I wanted to go and do this manually, I could then deactivate auto tune levels and I could do one of two things I could start dragging the sliders around for myself or I could use the eyedropper to select some white for the white relative exposure and select the black eyedropper and select some dark pixels to set the black relative exposure again I still feel like that is too extreme now Aurelian would probably cringe because he's going, I spent so much time and effort making this work and you're just going and ignoring it all. So I'm just going to dial these in manually, watching my histogram in the top right hand corner and just trying to get my histogram as close to the edges as I can. Now, just as a refresher, what we've got here in the graph are three lines. We've got this black line that runs from bottom left to top right that's dead straight what Aurelian refers to as the identity line. Then we've got this thick white curve, which is pretty much the tone mapping that Filmic is doing to our image. And then we've got this dark gray and slightly lighter white curve that is disappearing up through the top of the graph and then <laughs> reappearing on the right hand side. And that particular curve is showing us the range of mid-tone pixels which are remaining saturated and the range of shadows and highlights which are being desaturated. So just to remind you that one of the original goals of Filmic was to desaturate pixels as we move towards black and as we move towards white to emulate more closely the way film responded when you print it on paper. As you got towards the extremes of luminosity, the colors tended to desaturate. And so that's what that curve is doing. It's showing you how much desaturation is occurring in your highlights and your shadows. And we'll get to how we control all that as we move our way through this. Okay, at this point, we don't need to worry about the dynamic range scaling because we've managed to get our histogram wholly contained within the histogram graph. So let's move on to the second tab. This is a new tab in version four of Filmic. This is reconstruction. So Filmic V4 has built in the ability to do some highlight reconstruction if you've got clipped pixels within your image. Now, it should be noted, if you decide to use the reconstruction tab in Filmic, you probably want to deactivate the highlight reconstruction module if you've already got it activated or if it was activated by default on import. So with that in mind, where do we start? Well, believe it or not, we're going to come down here to display highlight reconstruction mask. And we've just got the icon to display the mask. So if we click on that, our whole image goes black. And what that's telling us is that there are no pixels selected at the moment for reconstruction. None at all. Any pixels that are going to be reconstructed will be white. Next up, the transition tab. My suggestion, even though this defaults to plus three EV, my suggestion is drag this all the way to the left, right? So it reads a quarter of an EV. Then 
in order to start picking up clipped pixels, we're going to drag the threshold slider to the left. And eventually we will start to see a black and white, like literally black and white, no shades of gray, rendition of our image. And as I said, whatever pixels are white, those pixels are going to be targeted for highlight reconstruction. Now, how do we decide where to set that? Well, my recommendation would be this. Come down to the bottom right hand corner here and toggle raw overexposed indication on. Because now we can see from this magenta crosshatch pattern which pixels in our frame are actually clipped. And then I would simply reduce the threshold until we get as close to just picking up those pixels as we possibly can. Once you've done that, turn that indicator off. And now I can explain to you what the transition does. So when it's dragged all the way to the left, we're basically saying to the mask between the pixels that are deemed to be needing reconstruction and the pixels that are deemed to be not requiring reconstruction, there should be a half, uh, sorry, a quarter EV transition in the mask. So over a quarter of an EV, the mask will go from pure white to pure black. So if we set that to a value of one, it may not look like the mask has changed to us, but we have now said between the pure white sections of the mask and the pure black sections of the mask, there should be a 1 EV shift in the exposure. So this is how you manage the blending between reconstructing the clipped pixels and how you blend those with the unclipped pixels. Make sense? Hopefully it will as we move forward. In my testing in getting ready to do this video and in my failed first attempt, I've come to the conclusion that somewhere around about 1.5 EV tends to be a nice value, at least for this image. It may be a case that depending on your image, your mileage may vary. It's up to you to try it out and see what works. So now that we've dialed that in, we can uncheck that. Now, before we go any further, let's just toggle the filmic module off and see where we're at compared with our original image. So off, on, off, on. The first thing I notice, when I turn that off, this lighter part of the sky actually looks a little bit greenish. Now, I don't know if that's something to do with the camera that this was shot on, and I think from memory this would have been my my uh, Konica Minolta 7D, I think. Uh, yeah, MRW, yeah. So that was, that was, wow, that's like three cameras ago. Yeah, so I noticed that that is, is really green. When I turn that on, the, that sky is a much more consistent blue without having done anything else. Uh, interesting. Okay, so moving on. Next up, we've got the balance section and it has three sliders. The first of which is structure versus texture. If we drag to the left, we are going for structure. If we drag to the right, we are going for texture. Now, what does that mean exactly? If we drag towards the structure side, we are assuming that all three color channels are clipped and what the algorithm will do is look for nearby pixels which are not clipped and try and reconstruct the highlights based on those non-clipped areas. So in a way, it's a form of removing the clipped pixels and replacing their values with the nearest neighbors that are not clipped. 
So I guess that's why it would be kind of like painting in a smooth gradient as per the tooltip. The texture side of this slider assumes that at least one of the three color channels is not clipped. And if one or two of the other channels are clipped, then it will copy values from the non-clipped channel in the same pixel coordinates uh, to the clipped channels. So it'll take the non-clipped values and paste those into the clipped channel values for the same coordinates within the frame. Make sense? Beautiful. Okay, next up, bloom and reconstruct. Again, if you drag the slider to the left-hand side, you are favoring the bloom part of the algorithm. If you drag it to the right, we are favoring the reconstruct part of the algorithm. What do they mean? Bloom essential, well, this whole slider is working in the wavelets domain and the bloom side of things assumes the coarse or low frequency values. So in other words, areas of, you know, similar color over a wide range of coordinates in the frame. Whereas the reconstruct side of the slider assumes high frequency or fine detail. So if you have lots of detail in the clipped areas, then you would lean towards reconstruct. I'm just going to chuck these in the middle for the moment. And then finally, gray versus colorful details. Should be pretty self-explanatory. If you move the slider to the left, then the Pixels which have been deemed in need of reconstruction will be desaturated, which I would have thought was happening already because that was the whole idea of the filming module. But if you really do want to retain color information, even though some of those pixels are clipped, then you would drag the slider to the right. So those are the three balance sliders and I will leave it to you to play with those as you see fit. Okay, moving on, we then have the look. This tab has the contrast, the latitude, shadows and highlights balance and midtone saturation. Now, contrast will do exactly like it says on the box. It adjusts the contrast of the entire image. How far you want to push this is entirely up to you. What you will notice is that as you adjust this, this central part of the thick white line either flattens off or gets steeper as you crank up the contrast. You will notice that the central point, the sort of orange colored dot, doesn't move. That is anchored at 18% grey and we'll come back to that in a moment. So contrast will allow you to boost the contrast as you see fit. Now if you drive it too far you will see these little orange lines in the top right and bottom left corners of the graph and that essentially means you are now clipping white and black pixels. And that's exactly what we came here to try and avoid. So we probably want to back that off until those orange lines disappear. The latitude slider refers to the width of the middle portion of this other gray curve or the distance between this white dot and this white dot in terms of horizontal width. And what that represents is the midtones, which are retaining saturation throughout the filmic module. To demonstrate this a little more, I'm just going to quickly drop this midtone saturation value down so that we can actually see the top of that curve. You'll notice that where that curve stops being a curve and actually flattens out to the top of 
you know, that flat section pretty much lines up with where this white dot is and where it starts to curve off again to the highlights is in line with this other white dot. So the latitude basically adjusts the width of that mid-tone range, which is retaining its saturation. Anything outside of that, so the highlights which are to the right of this white dot and the shadows which are to the left of this white dot, they are gradually being desaturated according to the shape of this grey curve. So, latitude, drop it back, fewer mid-tones are retaining their saturation and more of the extremities are being desaturated. As you increase that latitude, then more of the mid-tones are retaining their saturation and less of the outlying luminosities are being desaturated. The mid-tone saturation is, as the name suggests, a saturation control for those pixels which are in between the two white dots, uh, and it allows you to control how much saturation boost occurs to just those mid-tones. The shadows and highlights balance is simply that. If we drag it to the left, we are favoring desaturation of the shadows. As you can see, that gray, that dark gray curve sort of leaned off to the right hand side a little bit. So more pixels in the shadows are being desaturated and less pixels in the highlights are being desaturated. If we go the other way, the opposite occurs. We are now desaturating fewer of the darker tones, but we are desaturating more of the highlight tones. Okay, set that back to zero. And that's it for the look tab. Now, as I recall, in the previous version of Filmic, or maybe it was Filmic version two, there was a slider which allowed you to set an offset so that this dark gray curve didn't go all the way to the bottom left and right corners. You could actually have it disappear halfway up the sides. And what that meant was you weren't completely desaturating the outlying luminosities. But it appears that that particular control has now been removed. However, over in options, we have color science and we can choose between the current implementation, version 4, or version 3, which is the version of Filmic which came out with Darktable 3 at Christmas 2019. And look at that. It has the option to allow the desaturation not to be complete. So in this instance, it would be like 80% desaturation of the extreme blacks and whites but not complete. If we go back to look, is that what extreme? Yeah. Th so that final slider there on the look tab has now been changed over to extreme luminance saturation, and it allows us to control how much desaturation occurs at the very extremes of the luminosity range, so the very white and the very black pixels. Okay, jump back, set this back to V4. Preserve chrominance. I know I did look all of those things up at one point, but I don't remember what they did now, so please refer back to one of the two previous filmic videos uh, if you need a refresher on those. We've then got contrast in highlights and contrast in shadows, and both of those have the option of hard or soft. Under Filmic V3, the default was soft for highlight contrast and hard for shadow contrast. Feel free to play with those and see what works for you. Then we've got a couple of options here. Use custom middle gray values. Now remember I said this orange dot never moves because it's anchored at 18% gray. 
That was because Aurelian found from user feedback that there was some confusion on the part of users as to exactly where 18% grey should be. So by default, version 4 of Filmic doesn't even give you that option. It's turned off and it's just anchored at 18% and that's it. If you do want to take control of that middle grey, simply check this box and when you go back to the scene tab, you will see that there is a middle grey luminance slider added that wasn't there by default. Okay, turn that off. Next up, auto adjust the hardness. If we uncheck this box and go back to the look tab, you'll now see that there is a hardness slider here that wasn't there before. And what that allows us to do is move this central part of the tone mapping curve up and down, like so. Remember before that orange dot would never move off the identity line? With the hardness control, you can make that happen. Okay, turn that back on. Finally, iterations of high quality reconstruction. Now, I've got to say, I've played with this and I don't see any discernible change in the image. And it should be mentioned that if you increase this to higher values, it does become very CPU intensive. So be aware of that fact. It can take quite a long time for the module to refresh if you are requesting lots of iterations of the reconstruction module. In theory, it does smooth out the reconstruction a little more, but like I said, I've not really noticed the difference myself. So I'm just gonna leave that at one. And then finally, add noise in the highlights. So if I look over here at these clipped highlights, I can add some noise, I'll just go 0.5, and you can see it's added just a little bit of soft noise, it, it, maybe you can't, I'll just go extreme, there we go, 1.6. You can see all of this noise that has been added to my clipped highlights. And there are three types of noise, uniform, Gaussian, and Poissonian? I don't know, I've never heard of that one. I'm just taking a guess at how that's pronounced. Uh, but yeah, so you can dial in just a little bit of noise to help once again break up those, you know, massive big slabs of white pixels where you've got blown highlights. So that is pretty much it. I'm not going to look at the display tab because I honestly just don't get it. I've not really seen anything from mucking around with this target black luminance that makes any difference to the image. And I can see it's done something to the graph, but it doesn't appear to do anything to the image itself. It doesn't change the darkest parts of the image. And the target white luminance does do some crazy stuff to the image, which I just don't understand. So Aurelian, if you're watching and you want to sing out in the comments down below, Feel free to educate us, mate. We will be happy to learn. Okay, so that is it for Filmic version 4 as it appears in Darktable 3.2.1. Kath and I are off on a road trip for two weeks, so there won't be another video for probably three weeks minimum, possibly even for the next month. Um, our travel plans have just continually changed and changed and changed. We were originally hoping to be in Croatia this month, but obviously that's not happening. Not in 2020, my friends. Not in 2020. Uh, then we decided we'd do a road trip down to South Australia and Victoria, but if you're following any of the news from Australia, Victoria is just a no-go zone at the moment. They've had a massive coronavirus outbreak and the borders are closed, so that's off the table. Then we thought we might go to the Northern Territory, but then the Northern Territory said, yeah, we don't want anyone from Victoria or New South Wales coming here, so they closed their borders to us. So we are now doing a road trip through New South Wales. So I'm looking forward to that. It's been quite a while since we've had a holiday and a road trip is always a lot of fun. So hoping to get out and take some landscape 
photos whilst we're on the road and yeah, just see a bit of the state that we haven't seen before. Okay, so I will catch you guys in yeah three to four weeks. Don't worry, Fuji people, I haven't forgotten you. I did say that at the end of the video, I would talk about the idea of creating a preset. So what you could do is go to your exposure module, type in 1.25 as your default exposure value, and then click on the hamburger, go store new preset, give it a name, we'll just call it Fuji, and then tick the auto apply this preset to matching images. That will give us all this metadata from which we can create a smart rule or an auto preset. And what you would do is under maker, type Fuji, and then for safety, I would put another wildcard just in case there is any extra information in that field. So by putting the wildcard there, anything with Fuji in it, in that part of the metadata from your images, will be picked up by this automatic preset. And you will then just click OK. Don't change any other values. And that way, even if you have multiple Fuji camera bodies, every time you import new RAW files from your Fuji cameras, this automatic preset will apply a one and a quarter EV boost to the exposure. So if you have set that preference for a scene referred workflow, you will get filmic activated you'll get exposure activated, but instead of just a half stop boost, you'll get your one and a quarter stop boost. Now, obviously, feel free to change that value. If, if a single you know, one stop EV turns out to be enough, great, go with that. But that should get you guys out of trouble. Alrighty, that is going to do it. I uh, hope this has been helpful, and it has certainly been more concise than my first attempt at the video. Uh, Patreon supporters, thank you again for your support and I will chat to you all in three or four weeks time. See ya.